I'd like to welcome everybody to our first Cannabis Cultivation Masterclass here at the Harlem Business Alliance, along with Community Board 10 in Manhattan, uh, Cannabis Association of New York. I'm Franklin Henderson, one of the board of directors for Cannabis Association of New York. And um, today we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of the science, of science and art of cannabis cultivation for people that are interested in either growing from home or even uh, going into a business where you're gonna be working at scale. So in our first session, we're gonna talk about genotype, phenotype, and chemotype. And your genotype is gonna be the generic inheritance of traits. And your phenotype is gonna be the expression of those genes based on the environment. Your chemical composition of those phenotypes is also known as what people call chemotypes. Um, the second thing we're gonna cover in our conversation today is gonna to be the essential elements of growth for cannabis sativa. What are, what are the essential elements of growth? How do you manage those essential elements throughout the life cycle? So from a 1 million plus base pairs of DNA on the male side and 1 million plus base pairs of DNA on the female side, two flowers will pollinate and the female will produce seeds and that seed will give you a plant that will then represent your genotype, the inherited traits from both the male and the female. In, that plant grows out within a particular environment and no two environments are alike, but in the root zone, you'll have everything from the level of oxygen, the macronutrients, micronutrients, and water, as well as temperature. And then on the right hand side, you're going to have your light quality, light quantity, temperature, humidity, CO2, et cetera. And those things in the environment will determine how those genes express themselves in what we call phenotype. Of those, uh, in that phenotype, you'll find different phytochemicals from cannabinoids, anthocyanins, terpenes, flavonoids, esters, aldehydes, and ketones. Most people, the two chemotypes most people know of are THC and CBD. Along, uh, along the way, we may talk about Liebig's Law of the minimum, and it's the element that you have the least of that's gonna be your main uh, con uh, constraining factor on growth. So if you wanna get the maximum potential of growth from your plant, you're gonna to need to make sure that you have the necessary essential elements. The one that you're having the least of is gonna be your limiting factor. Of the essential elements, there are the macro elements, which you need in large, large concentrations, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, et cetera. And then there's gonna be much, much smaller uh, concentrations of iron, boron, chlorine, manganese, et cetera. This is um, an example of what deficiencies can look like at different levels for um, nitrogen in cannabis sativa, phosphorus deficiency, and potassium deficiency. And these are courtesy of HOMA for her capstone project on uh, nutrient deficiencies in cannabis. So ways that we'll manage nutrient deficiencies or nutrient management in the plant you're gonna have the possibility of using leaf tissue analysis. You can do regular analysis um, re to maintain your growing system. You can do diagnostic analysis if you notice a problem on a particular leaf, whether it's high on the plant, low on the plant, et cetera. Another thing you'll be able to analyze is your substrate or your soil, and it allows you to quantify what your pH is, your nutrient levels, um, and uh, the draining, and how fast your water is passing through your medium. Nutrient analysis sending your nutrients into a lab or your nutrient solution into a lab to have that analyzed. Um, people have had situ situations where they're growing commercially. They bought one fertilizer from a company. That company changes the, the recipe. Now they're having a nutrient deficiency because the recipe has been changed and the company didn't notify them that they changed the recipe, but they did their own nutrient analysis to figure that out. And then I was gonna have water tests as the last one. Uh, if you're cho choosing to grow outdoors, or possibly, uh, depending on your municipality, the water source that you're using to grow your plants could be an issue that you wanna address around nutrient management. Our guest panelists are Homa Hajarian, a recent Cornell graduate, and her master's is in plant science, and she conducted her research on nutrient deficiencies. She's a two-time business owner in, um, in the D.C. and Baltimore area, as well as um, working commercially in cannabis cultivation and other crops. We have Nicole M. Njaye, a mother of two, professor and business, professor, business professional, entrepreneur extraordinaire, and um, also a member of the Cannabis Association of New York's Social Equity Committee and the Black Farmers United. 
also founder of, you want to tell me about your businesses? Okay. Yeah, I'm Nicole Jai. I founded uh, Nahi, which is my hemp farm, and then um, OGMA, which is uh, originally grown Amish made, which is my CBD Amish brand, and then uh, Bossy Buds, which is the adult use cannabis brand. And we have Alex Nomber, the founder of Bodega NYC, and he's a New York cannabis uh, entrepreneur and lifestyle brand. He's a current card applicant and, and a card member of the Card Coalition in New York. And from there, oh, myself. I'm Franklin Henderson, affectionately known as Fetty G. I'm an employee at Cornell, as well as one of their recent graduates in their Master's of Professional Studies. I uh, specialize in com uh, controlled environment agriculture. I've formerly trained as an artist, but I've moved over to the sciences, so I operate in both of those worlds and um, also on the Cannabis Association of New York Board of Directors. So, let's start our conversation. So, one of the uh, ideas behind doing this is that we wanna expose people to some of the many different rabbit holes that you can go down nerding out on cannabis and growing cannabis there's a lot of information out there that's not always vetted, sometimes from companies that are trying to sell products or um, just basically chasing after revenue. What are some of the things that you want to think about when you decide what you're gonna purchase for your farm or cultivation or um, grow of any size? Um, cost and the environment uh, also doing things regeneratively. Uh, I work with the Amish community, so if you know anything about them, they use a lot of things from nature and just making a lot of my IPMs, which is uh, integrative pest management solutions and things, uh, cover crops and companion crops to be able to use that is helpful when growing cannabis. Anybody else like to? address the I mean for me um, I typically start with understanding what uh, strain I'm looking to grow given my um, my grow environment and my setup uh, I've done it in New York so everything's always been done indoors um, you know I always also try to figure out what grow medium I'm going to use whether I'm going to do soil cocoa or go straight hydroponic uh, because that's also going to try you know help you figure out what nutrients uh, you're gonna kind of focus in on. Um, but for me, it's really about genetics, you know, starting off with genetics. You know, if you have low ceilings, you might be more inclined to go with, you know, strains that are like cushions that are short and stocky. Um, if you have higher ceilings, it might, uh, you know, affect your decision to, you know, go after different strains. But, you know, you can't always go by the strain that you personally want because that's what you want to smoke. Um, you got to let kind of like what, you know, the setup that you have kind of dictate from there what, what's going to be, what's going to give you the best outcome and best result. So that's kind of like where I start before I even start like figuring out, yeah. you know, the nutrients and stuff. I would say one of the most important factors for myself is taking into consideration a plant's needs and the cultivar's needs and when you think about the specific cultivar needs uh, and compare cannabis to any other crop, you really don't have the level of information that we have about other crops. Let's say poinsettias, chrysanthemums. We know this specific variety has these specific needs, but that's still being discovered in the genetics, phenotypes, and chemotypes of cannabis. So I would say, Trial and error is actually a really good way to approach what you want to do. There isn't necessarily a guidebook down to the science and art for cannabis the way we want. So as scientists, cultivators, and artists alike, do a little experimentation. Make sure that you log what you do. Try this product, try that product. See what works best in the environment that you have and what goals you are trying to reach with your cultivation. 
Agreed. Um, one of the things I like to stress is that no two environments are the same. And so a lot of times you may read a recipe or something from someone's book or blog or whatever, and they're saying, hey, just do it like this and you'll get these results. Well, it worked like that in your environment, but at altitude or in a place that's really, really arid and dry and a place that's extremely humid, hum humid and a place that has 40 degree fluctuations that, you know, produces like moisture and dew points on the leaf, et cetera. What works for one person may not work for the other, but you'll need to kind of have some of those starting points to be able to analyze and look at what you want to change. Um, you were talking about choosing your genetics based on your space. Um, what are other things just besides height, besides just height, that you take into consideration? Um, also like flowering period. So like you, you want to try to figure out, um, I mean, if it's for personal, you basically have as much time as you want in terms of like, um, you know, what you want to grow and when you expect to flower. But if you're doing it commercially or you're doing it, you know, as a business, you kind of want to know when you expect to, you know, to harvest and then turn your room over. Um, and that, that plays a big role in just being efficient and also, um, you know, getting as many harvests as you can get in within like, you know, a calendar year. You know, typically people, in, you know, typically people want to get like six harvests in a year. Right. So it's like every two months, that's kind of like the goal. It's not always realistic, um, but you also have to understand that you have to as a as a former legacy grower, which and then I'm about, I'm actually about to start another grow uh, medical grow at home. But as a former legacy grower, we, we were always challenged with space. We never always had the ideal space. Um, what's important to do is make sure you ha you give yourself the space to grow. So you have a flower room, a veg room and a drying room. Um, and that way you can turn your room over, you know, quicker and you have more of the space to kind of like transition your, you know, your, your, uh, your harvest to, you know, dry and cure and then have that not be in, an, in the room because you're just trying to like manage with two rooms. Sometimes you need three or four rooms. Um, so for me, um, you know, it's, it's also about like space and, and timing and timing as well. Um, yeah, um, I think. One, like you can, each person can give their opinion, but oftentimes when people think about, okay, I got a 2,000 square foot space, I'm gonna blow it out. Blow it out. <laughs> yeah. And I'm gonna have 70, 75 lights. Yeah. And they haven't thought about like, all right, cool. When you cut those plants down, yeah. Where are they gonna go? Yeah. Oftentimes they haven't thought about, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to wait for these plants to veg for three weeks to a month yeah. before. I can even turn the lights on and even begin the clock ticking down the next harvest. Um, what percentage would you recommend either any of y'all, the two people, to a lot for um, some veg space and possibly um, drying and mother room? Um, well, it depends on how big your grow is. I mean, to determine that, and like um, Alex said at home, when they hit on a lot of key points that. You know, the genetics determine, you know, how it's going to grow. A sativa, you know, grows tall and the cut grows short and stocky. Just, you know, um, I think that spacing, proper spacing and knowing what, if I space them, you know, uh, a certain amount of feet apart, what was the result? Because when you grow on cannabis, outdoor, even indoor, um, the roots can determine how big your plant can be and even growing like a mother plant, you know, just having the root space because it's going to grow, it's going to keep growing the more you cut. It's like when you get a haircut, you know, mm -hmm. your hair keeps growing. So, you know, you treat her good, she's going to grow. So just making sure that um, you have an understanding to um, something that you said, what the plant calls for, because some plants call for more water, less water, you know. Um, so things like that, but I mean really just understanding um, what the type of genetic or the strand that you're growing, what it would do, or the performance. And it may be when you grow it, it does something different because you do something different, like as far as your feedings, like scheduling feedings and knowing. Um, I try to do everything at the same exact time. I try to do the same routine, and if I change something up, I try to pay attention to what the plant is doing at that time when I'm changing. And then if I get better results, then, you know, I'll keep that. 
um, going, but that's generally what I thought. Um, I, I had a comment. Yeah. I would say that when you're looking at the cultivar that you're growing, there's like approximate known yields. And let's say you have a um, thousand square foot space that you want to use for veg, flower drying. Sit down and do a little quick math. You've probably grown this cultivar before and you know that it's short and stocky or tall and you know that this plant, this one single plant that I have, will grow this tall, this is the amount of space I have. Do a little quick math and then you can determine how much veg space you need. Once you've determined how much veg space you need, you can go on to flower. The plants are gonna get bigger. You know that they need higher lights, higher ceilings, more ventilation. And then what are the known yields for this cultivar? I know that I can get, let's say, for example, like 13, 13 ounces um, off this one tiny plant. Not a lot, right? But if you can take that number and say it has to hang like this in this area for this long, then you can divide your space by what you really need to do. And once you've started growing the same cultivar over and over again, you know what it's gonna do, you know how much it's gonna give you, you know how it's gonna act, you know her. So then you can determine everything based on that. I would say that's my best recommendation. Yeah, okay, can I add to that? Um, I think when growing is definitely a lifestyle um, and the temptation to, because we all are weed consumers um, and we always like to try different weed. Um, we love the variety. Um, and then, you know, we smoke depending on the mood that we're trying to, you know, get. But when it comes to growing, to your point, it's best to just really uh, master one strain. And, and, and resist the temptation to have multiple strains in your room. Um, and the temptation's always there because people always say, oh, I got this cutting, I have, you know, I have these new cuttings, you read about some new strain you know, in high times or wherever, and, and you know, there's all these visions of grandeur that you're gonna have this 30% TAC strain that gives you a pound per plant and all this craziness. Um, but Especially now, in the, because this is becoming a business, and, 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 the, and the businesses that are going to thrive, are the, I, I, we, I feel, are going to be the craft businesses. Um, and so there's nothing like being able to master one strain than it is to try to figure out um, you know, how each one individually grows and having multiple strains uh, in your room. It becomes very difficult uh, you know, to kind of manage that and keep track of it because you know, you definitely have to have like a board, you have to keep notes, you have to know what the feeding regimen is for each strain, and each strain eats differently. Um, and you're, you're better served, I, you know, identifying one strain and just really putting your time and effort into, uh, into mastering it. Um, and it could take about two years, which is about multiple harvests to really fully understand what she likes uh, what kind of environment she likes, and then to dial that in. And, and, and in the long run, you'll be better for it um, just because it'll just, you know, you'll be able to dial it in and deliver a quality product. Um, I would add on to the, like, for one, um, I think it's important to start off trying multiple things and find out what works in your environment and gives you the results that you want in your environment. Um, and then from there, when you found out who your, what your winners are um, in that space, then you kind of you can now invest deeper or invest further in producing more of that. And now you get to like really fine tuning not only that plant, but also fine tuning your environment um, based on what you, know, you already have working for you and also the things that you can control. Yeah. So um, I think that one of the big things that's gonna come across often is experiment. You're gonna have to try multiple things and preferably in a controlled way <laughs> so that you can actually quantify like, hey, it's the 10 gallon pots, not the seven gallon pots. It's the one humidifier in each zone or a humidifier in the front and back, but not on the sides. 
(laughs) So depending on like what's going on in your space. And so there's a lot to consider. Like everything that I posted on that um, bubble map was just like stuff that I needed to get out of my head to be able to just even begin having the conversation of like, okay, this is what we're going for with the end user, which is like the phytochemicals that are grown inside the flower. But the way that we get there starts with millions of pieces of information that kind of come together to form your seed or your plant that then gets grown in an environment that has fluctuations across 10, 11, 12 different areas. And if you're not keeping up with that and able to say, this is quantifiably the temperature that every day I walk in my room, plants like it like this. They like this much cooler at night. They like it this much warmer in the day. They won't tolerate above 86. They will not tolerate below 50. You know, um, and knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you in your space is gonna be key. And if you're building out a big facility, it's just gonna take you longer to dial it in. You're gonna probably wanna start small, figure out how much space you're, how you wanna really allocate your space based on what you're getting back from your plants and then possibly scale that up once you've worked out some of the, some of the details over time. Um, gonna speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I was gonna say is just having you know, a collective group of people that you can call when you have an issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how many times I call Franklin, like, Franklin, my plants are doing this, can you help me, any right. suggestions? So just having like, you know, that network of people that are growers, nutrient soil specialists, I mean, they can speak to the lighting. I mean, just having someone in your network that you can always call. So I'm gonna get you guys number one. Yeah, take it down. <laughs> you know, I mean, just, you know, cause it is a new thing. And like um, Homer was saying, there is no book. This is a plant that we use for 3,000 years. It's been banned for 80 years. So a lot of what needs to be done is education, you know, redeveloping the mindset of what people feel about cannabis. You know, um, if we would have had a lot of the stuff that we had from 3,000 years ago, it would save us a lot of the trouble of learning. But as we do what we do and a bunch of other people, um, like Jesse and the Duchess and everybody that I know that's a part of this industry, we're finding, you know, we're making history in a sense and setting ways for people hundreds of years from now, methods and things that they're gonna do. So it's an exciting time, you know. And to that point also, I would say that's why it's important to document Mm -hmm. what you do. Yeah, for sure. So that, you know, it doesn't die with me or with you or with any of us up here and document some of the things that we've learned, some of the lessons that we're learning so that the next person is able to get that. And I love to say this, let's grow the next generation of growers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially with the people in this room and in this community that we're a part of here in Harlem, so. Yeah. I mean, I would like to just make like one public service announcement because this is New York and we love haze. Don't grow haze with any other stream. <laughs> grow haze in its own room because I've done it and she just takes over the whole room and just, <laughs> You know, the, little girl. The, the, yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, be mindful of the strains that you do grow uh, in, a, you know, in your room. But uh, Hayes is, a, she's a one of a kind um, strain, so. Um, thinking about indoor grows and also greenhouses that sometimes need supplemental light. And um, also outdoors, you have to think about set set times. Sun, you know, sunrise times and the angle of the earth that you're at, depending on where you, where your, where your farm is located. Um, what are some things that you would go back and tell old you well, about e- lighting? E- even, <laughs> well, even um, the genetics, like where were they uh, created at? Yeah. I mean, it will create a different um, result. You know, if it was created. Um, in an environment that is mostly like California, then it may do better there as opposed to growing in here. But if you breed that same genetic in this environment, it's gonna do way much better, you know? Yeah, Um, one of the things I was thinking about is just like different places on the planet. You got 12 hour days year round and you don't get a chance to actually veg outdoors if you were gonna try to do like full season outdoor in the summer. You're gonna put it outside and it's gonna instantly wanna go into flower. Some places up north and you know, in Alaska, 
Yeah. <laughs> Omanac <laughs> is my best friend. I get one every That's year. Cool. My kids, my friends. Yeah. I mean, Omanac, just knowing when, the, you know, how many days. The farmer's season. Almanac is yeah. a god. That's what I get. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one I'm referring to, the farmer's yeah. Almanac. Yeah. It gives you a lot of, okay. sorry, yeah. different, um, even recipes. For different right, things. exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would say that one of the biggest factors in having a cannabis business is how are you making money and how much money are you spending? So let's say I want to maximize my yields. I have all these fancy lights. They have all these high um, units of light that are really effective for growing. And I have six plants. And let's say I have X number of yields and I spent $35,000 on these lights, and then, I don't know, 5K every, every six months, every two months lighting it. How much, sit down and say like, man, how much money did I actually make from this plant? And how much money did I spend so on it? What, like what, you have to come up with a plan because as a, as a businesswoman, as anybody who wants to go into business, you have to look at your, your margins. How much money am I making? I bought these fancy, expensive, effing lights, and now I spent all this money and I only made this much money? What? And I mean, some of the lights pay for themselves. And like you said, if you, have a, if you have a greenhouse, if you have an indoor warehouse, they'll pay for themselves over like the course of 10 years, but if you have, let's say, a uh, one, one acre uh, greenhouse just, just for ease, you're gonna need at least like 20 minimum Gavita Pro HPS lights. The Gavita Pro HPS lights are like... 23, I think I just bought two for 2300. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a lot of money and you have to think about how am I making this plant and what inputs am I putting in and what am I getting out? Yeah, and that's one of the things I think, return on investment and then also thinking about scale. Yeah. And so, you know, with, fortunately with greenhouses, typically they're done in bays. Exactly. And so you might want to end up with an acre of greenhouse, but you might want to start with a quarter acre or four bays or five bays or what's like reasonable for you. Exactly. <clears throat> Grow, become profitable and then expand and scale, especially since you've already worked out the kinks. Because you might have spent 2300 on lights and realized, I don't even like these lights. I like these $900 lights over here. And you can't, no, no human being is gonna say, I'm gonna throw these $2,300 lights away and go buy 100 new $900 lights. You're out of $90,000. It's just not gonna do it. But um, I mean, I think you also have to factor in your own personal time that you're gonna put in the plants. Because, you know, you, you're, you're, there's no way to get around the work. Um, and so at minimum, you're putting in, depending on how many lights and how many plants you're, you know, you're growing. Again, I come from, you know, doing indoor. Um, there's just no way to like get around spending three to four hours of time in your, in your room at least four times a week. Um, and then, you know, come harvest time, that's, that could potentially be like four days of just, you know, round the clock, you know, work. Uh, taking down your plants um, so you know you have to put a value or valuation on your own personal time spent because guess what if it's not if the ROI is not there your personal time could be doing something else that actually makes you money um, the lifestyle is super addictive you know it's it's enticing it pulls you in it's it, it it's almost like a trap because you just want to keep doing it and you love it but you know it's like a, it's sometimes it could be an abusive relationship because like you know you got you want to let it go but you know you walk into your room the lights are bright you sit in there you want to start smoking you start you know you yeah. literally wow. spend half your time just staring at stuff it's, it's you know, a, like it, it, across it, the room you're like oh look at oh wow she's you know you're looking over there like what is she doing and you got to get over there and you know and you start cleaning, like it just becomes, so you, you have to be mindful of those things, um, mm. that your time is also money, not only just the hard costs that you put in, you know, for all that equipment, and, and, and that equipment isn't cheap, yeah. uh, but you have to buy the, the equipment, you know, to run your room. You, yeah. It's hard um, to cut corners. I was just gonna say that for a lot of people, the garden is their happy place. Yeah. 
but as running a business, you also have other parts of the business that you have to handle also. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I tell people that ask for advice or whatever when they think about like, all right, how much do I got to spend to go and get X and get 50 pounds a month? Right. I'm like, all right, for one, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's not a hard 50. Yeah. <laughs> that's a soft 50. It, yeah. it could be a little bit more. It could be a little less. It could be a lot less depending on how much you put into it. And then the other thing is how long are you willing to wait to be profitable? Because... Um, you know, you do have a lot of upfront costs, and a lot of people think first harvest, I'll be, I'll be, in, I'll be in the black, and then after that, second harvest is all profit. It's all profit, right? And it's probably somewhere closer to a year, yeah. two years, sometimes more. And again, it's one of those things where a lot of people, if you just look at a spreadsheet, seems great, yeah, should work that way. But again, if you're not paying attention to all of the different factors that you know you need to pay attention to to make to guarantee that you get that yield and you have a product that people actually care to buy um that part <laughs> yeah i mean i'm 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 applying for my card um i'm a brand right now um people ask me oh why don't you go into growing the growing scares me because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of commitment um and i know how i am i'm very like obsessive in, in, you know, in making sure that like when you're growing that you, your plants need that attention and there's just no, no cutting corners. I've worked with partners and, and grows before, you know, before the MRTA. Um, and a lot of people go into it like with crazy enthusiasm, like, yeah, we're gonna get this going and, and whatnot. And after like the second, third harvest, it's like, dude, where are you? Like. I haven't seen, have you come to the room? Have you seen the plants or like, have you done it? Like they, st you know, like if you're not in it, like, like if you're not really ready to do the work, be, be careful of like the partners that are gung ho about it. Because if they haven't experienced what it takes to actually maintain, you know, a room um, or a farm for that matter, um, they, they, I don't think a lot of people know what they're getting themselves into and I've experienced it with, you know, and so the reason why I stay away, I'm, 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 you know, stay away from it because I've had so much experience with other partners where they, they tell you that and then you end up being the one having to do all the work because there's no other, because the plants aren't going to just grow by themselves. They need that attention and what you put in, they're going to give you back. So just be mindful of that, uh, as well. Um, that's just from... 12 years of just growing, you know, as a legacy grower, um, my experience, you know. Yeah, I wanted to touch on um, outdoor grows and greenhouses. So plants need a certain level and amount of light per day. Um, so usually they, they say cannabis needs about 24 units of very fancy science words that I'm not going to go into. But it, let's say it needs 24 units of light per day. And this uh, cultivar was bred in Poland where they have very different light levels. Like it gets dark at this time and here it gets dark at another time. And your plant still needs that same amount of light. So when you buy certified Afghan kush, blah, 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 from from uh, I love marijuana, like, right? When you've bought those and it says it'll need this much light, um, you have to take into account that that was in Poland. And here in New York, let's say you have a big farm in upstate and you have a greenhouse and you need supplemental lights to get the same effect from the plant. So it really depends on where you are, how much light you get a day, and the intensity of the light you get a day. So you really have to like look into your supplemental lights and see, okay, um, I'm here in upstate New York, and I have, you can buy a, a device, what's that one it's called? A, um, a PAR meter. meter? Yeah, yeah like PAR and yeah. PPFD yeah. meter. Exactly, you can buy a meter and see how much light you're getting. That term you're looking for? Uh -huh. Daily light integral. Daily light integral, thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah, so the daily light integral, um, no, I was thinking of micromoles per, per unit. Per but yeah, unit, but that's daily light interval integral uh -huh. is based on. Is based on that, on yeah. That. So um, you have to really sit down and figure out 
Indoor grows are different. You have your lights on at all times. But when you're in a greenhouse or on a farm, you're using the power of the sun. So you take out your meter and you see that um, through the greenhouse, it says I have 18 units right now. Well, I need 20. Let's pop on those lights and make sure they get as much light as the plant needs to grow to its potential. Yeah. The other thing too, um, what Alex is saying, it's very uh, labor intensive to grow cannabis. So. Um, when you plant it, when you harvest it, um, through the growth cycle, treating the plants. So you have to have a system in place or individuals, bodies, you know? And like you said, people start and think it's fun and they want to be a part of it, but when they see how much work is involved, they nine times out of 10, you'll be by yourself, like how you started. Um, the other <laughs> thing, you know, is, is, uh, is um, I, I, I'm in the community garden, so when you think about growing fruit and vegetables, it's like fun. Farming is fun. I mean, you know, gardening is fun, but farming on like on a large scale is hell. You know, if you don't have proper things in place. So I always say when members want to come in my community garden, oh, you have to volunteer this amount of hours, and they'll you know start off really enthusiastic, <laughs> and then you know I'll be like, hey, I'm out here. It's January. We need to you know get these beds ready. It's like, yeah. oh, it's cold. You know this. So it does bothers. take a lot of commitment. It does take a lot of dedication. You know, you can be enthusiastic about it because it looks cool. And as you put a seed into the ground and you watch it grow and do different things, you know, it's exciting. But the commitment and the dedication has to be there as well because it is labor intensive. You have to have people that, you know, um, will show up, you know, when you plant, when you harvest. Like I plan on planting a bunch of seeds this year. So anyone, you know, want to come to a cloning party, you know, <laughs> have these kind of parties. That's how you do it. Transplant party. Yeah, have it as a party. You know, say, come on over, bring your scissors and your gloves, you know. <laughs> um, I want to hit on, agree completely on the um, labor part and also just on the greenhouse and even um, people that are thinking about doing outdoor farming. There's these things called microclimates, and there's a river, the Hudson River. On this side of the river, there's a mountain, and the air gets trapped there, and all the rain ends up being right there. Mm. At altitude, less rain, you might have hard hard time accessing, accessing water. On the other side, they don't get the rain, and they have the perfect day. They can go until late September, October, with big, huge buds on their plants, and <laughs> never get powdery mildew, never get botrytis, or any of that kind of stuff. And so... There's a bunch of things like that that will affect the way you try to nurture, care for, cultivate your plants, and also the way you express yourself as a farmer and what you really find does it for you. Because a lot of times when people do find that thing about cannabis and growing cannabis that they love, it can be not only healing for you as well as just like, it does become your happy place. It's like gardening as therapy and knowing that like, hey, I just, I'm getting out of the city. I'm gonna be on my farm for three days, and I'm just—that's what I'm doing. You don't don't call. I don't have signal up here. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a, I mean it's a lot of work. Um, it, it could sound a little discouraging, but also, you know, like what I said before, this is where the craft aspect of the business really plays into because, like, what Fetty was saying, you know, you're gonna only, you're gonna have those micro environments that you control or that you you know. Um, are familiar with or you figure it out uh, and it'll be you that has that specific strain that nobody has that's grown in a certain way because I'm sure we've all has have smoked you know haze from three or four different people and it was like isn't this the same thing but it tastes different um, or you know I've had Girl Scout cookies and it's like oh, this isn't the same Girl Scout cookies that I smoked before this is not the you know the same kush that I smoked before because every grower has their own way of growing and that strain is also being grown in a different environment um, so you know when you can dial in you know that strain in that environment and and and, and dial in that craft that's where you're going to win uh you know long term um so it's not i don't i don't want to like feel like to discourage people that want to do it because that's really where the opportunity is uh and i think that's where people should really like 
put a lot of time into figuring that aspect out. And then, you know, once you do it, then, you know, I, I think, you know, you could, uh, you do well. Yeah. And then, you know, what I would say is just learn, like, about the services in New York. Um, they have, you know, places where you can send your soil and get it tested. They have a place where you can get uh, a water testing kit to test your water. Um, you know, talk to the people that are professionals when it comes to if you want to make an edible, you know, a food and beverage clinic, um, someone, a commercial kitchen, you know, understand, you know, the process of what you have to do to kind of make these products, um, if that's what your goal is. and. The other thing um, that I will also say is that if you're not, like farmers are farmers, they're not business people. Um, and I think we hit a lot of that. Um, you know, find the people that can help you do the business part that are professionals. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say stay in your lane, but if you're good at something, focus on that and find the best person or the most expert, you know, ex the person with the most expertise in that area. So if it's accounting, you know, find the best accounting. You're doing a business, you know, understand what that 280E expenditure law means to cannabis. You know, if you're coming in, bringing investors, understand what the TPI is to New York State. All of this stuff is very, very important. You know, it's an opportunity where you can create something that can, you know, ultimately bring generational wealth to your family, you know, but doing it the right way because New York, has rolled this program out and they're giving small people like us the opportunity to build businesses before the larger companies come in. And New York is gonna be one of the places that um, people just come for the culture. People are just gonna come here just to experience cannabis. You know? Yeah, I would say um, one of the things about this unique New York market that's unique is that we have 18,000 coffee shops within a five mile radius but people have a coffee shop that they like to go to, where the people know them and there's co the, the roasting of the coffee, the way that it's steamed, everything is specific to, it really suits their palate. And I think that New York cannabis market is gonna very much mimic that and that like people are gonna find what works for them. And it's not always gonna be the big hype strain that they saw on Instagram, but it might be the thing that, you know, from the farmer down the street or the cultivator was like, Tell people all the time, meet a farmer. Like once you get, <laughs> go to the source. If you can get it from the source, go to the source. You're not gonna get anything fresher and you'll really actually get to get closer to the love that's poured into it and put into it. And I think with that, I think we could open it up for questions. Grab them. Anybody? Questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> um, so, I don't know how this plays into it about some of this, uh, some of these, I guess, larger ones. I, I guess they're not legal yet, but Mad Men just filed for bankruptcy or, or whatever it's called. And then another one also. So how does that play into what New York is doing? Because these are big and they're filing for bankruptcy because of all the debt. <laughs> Um, from what I experienced um, in California with the, regular, uh, with the rollout of their adult use market, a lot of these companies are pulling up because they were not allowed to monopolize in those states the way that they were allowed to monopolize in some others. And with that, I would say um, that when you are playing at that large of a scale and you drive the price down and you have to stay in it for a long time to actually make that money back, those companies can e much easier just file for bankruptcy and pull out of certain states and out of certain markets, which actually probably fares well for the New York market. We'd much rather have, I'd much rather have a bunch of small companies making a decent amount of money than six companies owning the entire market in a state and that you go to the store and you can only get those five brands in the whole entire state when I know and you know that cannabis is much, much more diverse and provides many more different profound experiences than what six large corporations can provide. Yeah. yeah. I, I also, MedMen is medical. Yeah, they're, they're the medical, medical and MSO, medical, yeah. The medical dispensaries are, are bleeding money right now yeah. because they're up against what is a really strong legacy cultivation market and obviously 1,300 
locations all over the city. So there's a, a really chaotic uh, space right now. I wanted to go back with like maybe some tools that you guys could share around. You know, I was really interested in hearing logging your uh, results. And I, f I hear a lot of opportunity there maybe for somebody who wants to create a log um, journal type of thing. And then also, you know, talking about what the opportunities are in craft cannabis. I want you guys to really go into that because I do think that is what's going to set the New York market apart is the craft. And so if we can just expand on that and what the opportunities could be. Absolutely. Well, I, mean, well, you wanna, oh. well, I was going to... I was going to say, um, the craft is in the MRTA, so mm -hmm. OCM has to identify what craft really means before we can say craft, right? That's the first thing. The second but thing... Your, their comments can help with that. Yeah. Yeah. And your com yeah. 13. So that's the first thing as far as craft, and then um, to the other uh, question um, as far as um, when you, you mentioned about data, they have like tracking software. So we're required as licensed growers to use something called BioTrack, um, but I'm using something internal called Proteus 420. So that's like a software um, that is used to be able to track things from um, everything, from you know the plant from beginning to end, also when it goes to sale and how it gets handled. And then Alex, I guess you can speak. Yeah, I mean, I think on the on the operational side, um, is it is vital um, because you know you're gonna you're gonna set your plan in terms of how you're gonna feed your plants, you know, from you know from veg to you know to flower to you know um, end of flower, and so it's important to be as meticulous as possible because that's how you're gonna be able to figure out problems sooner than later. It's the problems that you can't fix that cause a disruption in your entire growth. It, and it could literally be one thing that is throwing off your entire plant. It could be maybe they just started doing some construction on the pipes and now your pH that you just assumed was seven because New York is always seven. I've always found that incredible because I've had grows in Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, and the, <laughs> the pH on the water is always seven. But there could be times that that could affect your water um, and it can make it harder. Um, it could add more, you know, uh, micronutrients that you weren't expecting that you take for granted. So um, it's vital to keep track of those things because you can then, you know, know what's going on. And you could literally have one incredible harvest, you know, and then the next harvest with the same exact strains can be a completely different experience and you'll be like, what the, what's going on? Like, what is throwing it off? So keeping detailed records of every step of what you're doing will just kind of like help you not only dial in the, the, the plant, but also identify problems uh, so that you can fix them right away. Um, I fell in love with measuring everything. Oh, <laughs> so after. So um, whether you make your own spreadsheet, and keep that, you know, room number one, room number two, bedroom, and, you know, say you do a water test every six months, but you're regular checking your pH every day. Every time you mix water, you, you check your pH. Every time you mix your nutrient solution, you check your pH, so you know what pH you're feeding at. If you're also then checking your pH in the soil or the runoff from the soil, now you have the, the runoff number. You can see the difference between what you're putting into the water, into the soil, and what's coming out of it. There's a, and, but the beauty of it is that now we have smartphones yeah. and tablets and different things. And so they have devices that you can, that are Bluetooth wired, that you can go by and you know, stick the sensor directly in the soil or the substrate of your plant, get a pH reading, get an EC reading, and it goes, and it logs it for you. So we're gonna get into a lot more of that in the second session, but um, there are, we brought it up because there are ways to get this information and ways to track it that are accessible to everybody now. Well, just one other thing, um, just speaking with Alex, so the pH is important to know how um, the alkaline affects the water. So like he was saying, seven. So when you get a pH tester, you have, you know, it goes from like six to 9.5 or something like that. And they have little kids, so that is very important uh, to be able to, to water your plants. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could share 
Um, so I've done many grow, home, grow room rehabs um, in the past where I've been called because there's a problem. I had one guy tell me, he goes, I don't get it every time, and he was growing in soil indoors, he goes, every time the last two and a half weeks when I'm flushing the plants out, he goes, they keep burning up. And so I'm like, you know, so I'm looking at the, you know, I'm testing the soil, whatever. Um, and after asking a, a couple of questions, I asked him, I said, well, so what are you flushing it with? He's like, I'm just giving it water. I don't know how I came around to asking him what the pH of the water was, because he was in Staten Island and I was just assuming it was seven. Um, I said, have you tested the pH of the water? Because I just couldn't figure out like what he was doing. Because he's like, they look so nice. And then at the end, the last three weeks, he, he showed me a plant, they're burning up. So when I got around to the pH of the water, he's like, he's like no, I, I bring my pH down to 5.0 when I flush the plants. And I was like, bro, <laughs> you know what you're doing right now? Your, your dirt already has nutrients in it. So now you're hitting the soil with a 5.0 uh, pH, which means the, it becomes more acidic and now the roots are gonna uptake the nutrients. Even though you're not giving it nutrients, there's already nutrients in your soil. And because you're get, hitting it with 5.0, whatever nutrients are in there is basically take, telling the plant to uptake those nutrients faster and you're burning out your plants. Literally, one thing that he was doing wrong was causing like, this guy was really like on the verge of tears because he just couldn't figure out what he was doing. He said, I had fresh soil. I changed out the soil. You know, I got bigger pots. Like I don't have root rot, like whatever. And so it's very important to just like something that simple could literally just derail your entire grow. Yeah. So it was, it was a mind, I, I couldn't believe it when he told me. I like you called it, you said you the uh, room rehab. Grow room, yeah, I want to do like a reality show called yeah, Grow Room Rehab. I love it, I love it, I love I've it. I've gone into rooms where it's like, they, the, the, the guy spent like $70,000 on like the best equipment. And I'm like, I'd walk in and like, it just looked like the most depressing place in the world. But I'm looking, I'm like, oh, you got that board? Oh my God, I always wanted to get that. Or you got this thing? Oh my God, I, that's such amazing equipment. And you walk in and, and it's the most depressing room you've ever seen. So yeah. buy all the equipment in the world, but you, you, you still got to do the test. And you got to keep the notes and you got to know what you're, you know. It's been a pleasure. You know, I want to thank you, Franklin, for even having me um, come. You know, thank you, Candy. You know, um, just a quick uh, little plug. Um, I sit on the chair of the New York City Committee with Candy, and we have an event on Wednesday in honor of Black History Month. So we're going to be honoring um, Branson and a few other legends uh, in the industry that um, has paved the way in New York City. So um, the uh, tickets are on Eventbrite, and then we're also going to have another um, ancillary business um, meeting at uh, the Citadel on March 16th, and this event, February, will be February 15th. You guys are welcome. I would love to have you. What? You had another question? Yeah, yeah just really quick. Um, uh, it, outside, outside of taking seed and going out in your backyard and putting it in the soil, um, it, it, it sounds like there's some sort of a need for people who, who know their cultivar strains and, and the, the, the matrix in the, in the pot or, or in the warehouse is the same exact thing that you're using in, in the same exact cultivars and the same, ex if, as long as people are doing due dil diligence on, on uh, uh, you know, like what, what you were talking about, nutrients and, and is there some way to put together some sort of, I don't know, social media? It's like, I'm doing this and I'm doing this with this cultivar. And, and somebody else sees it, oh, I am too, but the, uh, something's wrong with mine. You know, what am I doing wrong? Well, okay, now you can go down through it. But it takes people doing some really hard um, uh, 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 writing and, and being diligent about things. But it, I, I hear people saying things, that needs to be in a, in, a, in an accessible way for other people to, it seems like it, yeah. The Duchess has her hand back up back there.
attempt to get a collective uh, information about particular things. And one of the, you know, the, the shortfalls with that is that there are literally thousands of strains. So if you're doing like Blue Dream, maybe a whole bunch of people have done Blue Dream, but I'm growing Super Lecker. And unless you're like from Spain, you're not growing Super Lecker, so that's not gonna be helpful. But there is an, um, you know, massive amount of people trying to help each other. And that's one of the amazing things about social media. So one of the few first things I would go to is hit up Grow Diaries, just to see if anybody has put up what their particular, um, what they have uh, seen has been the case. And if you have a good, good breeder, you often can reach out to the breeder and find out where they have done, you know, they sent out testers. So what their testers, if they were good testers, said about, you know, I was growing the mandarina and this is what I found. You know, they liked extra humidity or whatever. But Grow Diaries is super helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. You mentioned earlier about the importance of focusing on one strain, right? Mastering that one strain, which I agree with. And I wanted to know, like, how many plants would you suggest that someone start when they were trying to master one strain? I mean, I think Fetty kind of mentioned it earlier. Start small, as small as you can, um, before you kind of make that you know, financial commitment and that time commitment. So, you know, start with one light, maybe three plants. Um, I don't know if you're, come, if you're starting from seed, you know, I've experienced, you know, buying a pack of seeds um, and all three, you know, feminized seeds, all three kind of express themselves differently. You know, like, wow, I, I, this holy grail plant looks different than this holy grail plant versus this holy grail plant. So then you kind of want to start with that to then first identify the phenome type um, and then which one you, you want to keep. Um, but I would always start small because it's, it's better to start small and dial in your environment and then, and then scale out because you just don't want to start off with like, if you don't know what you're doing and you're just learning, you, you don't want to start off with like 40 plants. It, it could just overwhelm you. Um, but start with one light. I mean, you could you do really nice, you know, and you just write and write everything down, keep notes you know, every little thing that you do. Every grow that I've ever had started off too crowded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it got narrowed down either because some things were a little bit weaker than other things. Um, some things just showed themselves to be more preferential or, um, but ultimately I had to make some choices and I knew that I wasn't gonna be able to get the garden to full health unless I narrowed down. And now I think I give myself a lot more space per plant to start with and then figure out if I have room, do I want to add more from there? Uh, he had his knife first and then we'll come back to you. Hey, uh, David Elliott from the New World Center. Uh, Alex, what's up? We have the same chat in the Carter Coalition. Oh, what's up? Oh, what's up, man? I've <laughs> seen you up there. Uh, yeah. uh, in regards to what she said, um, and starting small, I think you should start legal, right? <laughs> we got, we got, it's six plants is what we can grow, so that, we're gonna keep it there. Yeah. Uh, and then <laughs> one challenge that I've seen, and then you, you say this, well, we gotta stay consistent with the, with the cultivars and the genetics that we grow, but the, we always chasing that unicorn, right? It's always the new strain that comes in, so now we gotta dial this in. The new strain that comes in, so I mean, it can be frustrating, but you gotta have fun with it. So if you're not dedicated, you ain't doing crap, and I appreciate you guys. Mm -hmm. So um, I have another question. Um, I, I'm just here today because I wanted to come and learn and find out. I, I don't know anything. Okay. But I do know a strain that I like. Now, I do know that. <laughs> so how would I start, even starting slow, with a strain called um, apple fritters? It's a good strain. How, you know, what, do I get a seed? Is it, do I go from some, you know, some specific? How, how, you know, with that particular? Um, there are places you can find apple fritter, uh, genetics, uh, the lumpies cut. I, I would start first start, figure out who the breeder is, start following that person on Instagram or whatever social media they have and start learning where some of this product shows up so that it ended up in the hands of a grower at some point. If you were ever, if you ever experienced it, that means that somebody grew it. And so start following some of these people in social and other places come into things like this, you never know who you might bump into who already has a cutting of the apple fritter 
that can give you a cutting or point you in the direction of like, hey, this isn't apple fritter, it's an apple fritter cross, but it carries a lot of the traits of the original mom, et cetera. So there's a way, I would, it's, it's research. And um, oftentimes you start off buying from seed companies online because they're easy and accessible. And then you grow them out and you realize that some of them are more credible than others. And that so this one truly expresses those traits that I was looking for, this one not so much. Mm -hmm. And you go from there, and it's a, it's a process over time. Thank you everybody, thanks for coming, and um, we're gonna have lunch and then we're gonna start session two.